see. Shells. <laughs> so, how did you get started on this whole magic thing back in the day? Hmm. Difficult to say, really, how it all kind of came together. Um, I suppose my boyhood heroes were people like Doctor Who. Science attracted me from a young age. I became a, a virulent atheist um, and spent a lot of my spent all my R, RI lessons at school arguing violently with my RI master. And then, I, I was about sixteen or so, I started picking up witchcraft books from the library. I remember the good old days when you could find things like Paul Hewson's books. And stuff, and I suppose um, a certain attraction to the romance of sorcery to complement my scientific studies. Uh, the interesting thing about some of the books those day available in those days, you were just beginning to get the sort of books which weren't just you know about the history of it, but uh, books which said, "Well, this is actually how you do it," and. Um, I got increasingly interested in the idea. A few kind of curious psychic experiences uh, before I went up to college. And then when I got to college, it was kind of hippie era, and all, people were looking at all kinds of mystical stuff from all over the place. And um, picked up Elephus Levi. I was quite impressed by the idea that you could actually start theorizing about magic, even though his ideas were a bit, um, a bit 19th century. Um, the whole idea of uh, there, there being magical theories sort of interested me, and then I got, kind of got onto reading Alistair Crowley, and um, got a bunch of mates together at college, and we tried out a few rituals and things. And it all sort of went from there, I suppose. Um, I qualified in chemistry very reluctantly. I mean, it was fascinating at O-level. Just as exactly the same again with nothing new at A-level. And when I got to college, I realised, oh, God, we're just going to do the whole lot again. Uh, but just in more detail. I mean, at least biology has life to ponder upon and physics has the universe itself to ponder on although that wasn't emphasized in those days but chemistry well it's just glorified cookery really so I spent most of my time at college studying magic really got a precisely calculated uh, scrape pass in the chemistry <laughs> and then um, just carried on from there I mean my my interest really developed at college. I met all the sort of London Illuminati of the era. Gerald Sister, Lionel Snell, and Ray up in Yorkshire. My interest has just developed from that, really. Just you know, continuing reading, studying, thinking, getting people together to try stuff out. And thus it goes on. Still crazy for the ultimate secrets of the universe 40 years on. <laughs> Nice. Uh, you mentioned uh, Paul Houston, I assume, obviously mastering witchcraft. Uh, that seems to be a trend for the people I've interviewed. Was that one of the first books? That was Nicky and Jake's first book, I believe. Uh, quite likely. I can't actually remember now, but I do remember in that era you were just starting to get the appearance of um, how to do it magic in public libraries. And... Uh, the Brighton Public Library had stuff like that, so blame it all on that. Did you recite the Lord's Prayer backwards and do all the... Uh, yeah, I probably did once or twice. Yeah. The so book has a very appealing title, especially if there's not much else. It actually says Mastering Witchcraft. Yeah. yeah. I will take that. <laughs> uh, in terms of childhood, um, I haven't actually... Um, do you have incidents or memories of things that would now be considered high strangeness? Did you live in a haunted house? Ever been abducted by aliens? That kind of thing. 
uh, no, the main things I remember were um, odd kind of um, bits of telepathy with my mother. Um, my mother told me from an early age she could always tell when I was lying. So we entered into, I suppose, some kind of psychological um, game in the long term. Um, and there were some curious incidents where um, things I dreamt, I checked with her afterwards and she confirmed them. Um, odd things I... Sometimes if something happens in the family, I'll ring her up and say, has that just happened? And she'll say, yes. Um, but I think possibly one of the things that... This must have been when I was about 16 or 17. I was just walking uh, down a slightly darkened uh, area in uh, the outskirts of Brighton. And there was a chap in some kind of a uniform... Well, I've just been a bus conductor or something, I don't know, walking a bit ahead of me. And I just thought, I wonder if I can throw a psychic bolt at that bloke. So without making any noise or anything, I just made a gesture and a, and a strong mental intent. And the guy jumped like he'd been kicked in the backside. And I just looked away. But that convinced me, yes, maybe there is something in all this. Um, hope it didn't do him any harm. But... Um, yeah, I suppose if that hadn't happened, um, my career might have run off in a completely different direction. I might just be an industrial chemist now. Who knows? Uh, so, in between finding these books in Brighton Library and sort of uh, college and kicking around with the London people at the time, would you say you moved in a kind of uh, witchcraft, ceremonial, magic direction pre chaos? How did you have a self-identified label, for instance, for what you were playing around with at the time? Not, not really. I mean, the the first um, one of the first groups that I formed with a couple of friends we called Stoke Newington Sorcerers because we met in a basement in Stoke Newington owned by one of our members and uh, initially we were just mucking about with <laughs> simplified bits of Golden Dawn work at that time um, the great big Regardi compendium of Golden Dawn rituals had come out and we uh, were just mucking about with some sort of simplified versions of that. It's obviously very verbose in the original, but we did a few bits like that, less of so banishing rituals and things, and uh, attempts to charge yeah. talismans and, yeah. and things. Um, but then, then the Austin Spare material became available, and uh, that was quite an eye opener for me, really. Um, that's when it all went kind of free form and chaotic for me. The I spares inspiration that you don't really need all this um, rigmarole. The ultimate mechanisms involved are psychological maneuvers to bring the subconscious into play. And uh, so this seems to lead up to the sort of Superman origin story of, of chaos. Is that um, was it at that stage where um, the idea to uh, yeah? But tell me the story about how the word and the idea of let's call it this, let's do these things happen. Um, well, I got in the, into the habit of, of getting interested people together to try stuff out, and. Um, People at that time were were writing their own rituals. You know, they, they weren't so dependent. Everyone had given up on the idea of trying to do the Golden Dawn stuff. Um, they were taking from Crowley um, the basically the ecstatic techniques, but often not the detail of his rituals. And 
we were just cobbling together things to see if they would work. Um, often based on Austin Spare's really simple principles of making sigils, we'd often knock together a ritual whose main purpose was just to consecrate an Austin Spare type sigil. <coughs> Parapsychology experiments and various other things. Um, and it was really this free form nature um, that gave rise to the idea of, of, of chaos, just random creativity. You know that the first book doesn't make a great deal of mention of, of chaos. Um, and it was only really the advent of Gleek's book on, um, on chaos when the word became, uh, you know, pop in the popular imagination that we sort of formally adopted the title of Chaos Magic and I titled the second book Li uh, Liber Chaos. So even even the name Chaos kind of just got um, appended a bit later on. I mean, it had taken a, a certain amount of romance of sorcery uh, from Michael Moorcock's ideas um, that there were chaos gods as well as gods of order. Uh, the whole thing kind of came together as a, as a syncretism of all those bits and pieces, particularly the free-form approach of Austin Spare, which appealed to a lot of people at the time. Nice. I was going to ask about that. Um, the, the first book, um, the reason for writing them was sort of, well, we're doing this stuff, we should put it together in a form that other people could use, because it does... The, the books of chaos predate the word chaos. <laughs> well, I... At the time, uh, little occult magazines were all the rage, and um, Ray Sherwin used to publish this thing, um, I think he called it the New Equinox, originally. Um, when I met Ray, he was, he was quite into Alistair Crowley's dilemma, and the magazine was fairly focused on that, and um, it was available in Atlant <coughs> Atlantis in London, or he could post it to you. And um, I just started jotting down some of my observations and occasional rituals and things in that. And as a result of that, I got to meet Ray and we, I went up to Yorkshire to see him. And um, the whole idea of doing more free form, um, creative stuff with a bit of a nod to the past and a, and a big acknowledgement to Austin Spare seemed to kind of capture the um, the popular imagination at the time so eventually all the notes that I'd um, made of all the various things I'd done with groups and, and done on my own I put them together into this book in, in a smallish book and gave it to Ray to publish because he was mucking about with small scale publishing and then I uh, disappeared off to India for a couple of years and uh, at some point Ray posted me a copy of this and this is the mysterious uh, Liber Null with the white cover of which possibly only two copies were ever in existence um, whilst I was out in Australia I, I set up another group the Church of Chaos with a local wizard there and then on the way back I, I took the book in inverted commas that Ray had produced and rewrote it up in the Himalayas and then when I came back to India uh, from India I went and lived up in Yorkshire in Ray's village and we decided we'd try and make a bit more of it, so I expanded it a bit and we brought out the, the red cover Liber Null, which um, we made about 400 copies of in Ray's kitchen with a big stapling machine. And we flogged nearly all of those to the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Um, and then, as a result of the work I did with Ray and his friends up there, people like Dave Lee, I wrote another bit called um, Psychonaut. Uh, and 
the Sorcerer's when Apprentice published that, advertising it as the supreme blasphemy or something crazy, and it even got mentioned in the House of Commons <laughs> um, as being a book that shouldn't have been published or something like that. Um, and then I persuaded Wisers, well actually Gerald, just to help me persuade Wisers, to publish it properly, and they wrapped the two things up together, and that was my first book published by a proper publisher. And it all kind of went from there. I went off to India again for another year after that. And then um, when I got back, uh, the Wise's book was achieving a certain amount of widespread recognition and I, I got invited to do all sorts of things got invited to go over to Germany and Austria and um, uh, Switzerland to do various sort of lectures and seminars and, and out of that um, a wider sort of IOT developed uh, the IOT had initially just been me and Ray and a few friends up in Yorkshire and then a small temple I opened in Bristol when I got back to the UK but after the visits to um, the German speaking world it started to uh, grow into something a bit bigger so that's how it all came about really um, that's cool that brings the story up to uh, IOT there is the matter of your um, premature magical retirement between uh, dropping out of the IOT and then coming back um, which we're all very grateful for with the books from the last uh, few years. What was there? A, was it just I feel like I've been there, done that, or was it? Time well, to it was a, a great combination of things. The um, the guy who'd organised the uh, the seminars and the lecture tours and things in the German speaking world, we had a very big fallout in the end, which which is called the Ice War. I mean, basically, he got involved with a guy who had uh, some very authoritarian ideas about what esoteric should um, should involve, and I didn't really want that brought into our order, and we fell out rather massively over it. There was schism within the European part of the order. In fact, a schism which affected even some of the uh, the temples in America and and Britain to some extent, particularly in Germany, although the Austrians. Were and, uh, <laughs> above it all, mainly. Um, and fixing that was a somewhat painful and exhausting business, which resulted eventually in, in, in this guy uh, leaving, it, leaving the whole thing. Um, so I went back for one last... Um, big bash in an Austrian castle with all the Europeans and a few Americans that came over and after that I thought well I've got a couple of choices here you know I can, I, I, I can either spend a lot more time on this and a lot more energy uh, I did not want to become dependent on magic for a living I didn't want to become a, a commercial magus um, like the German guy did I didn't want a cult uh, I didn't want to have to make my living out of it and make compromises plus I also had a a business and a family developing in the UK which were demanding increasing amounts of my attention and I also felt the challenge to solve certain problems which had arisen between my magical and scientific views so I just said to all the people in the IOT look I'm just <coughs> retiring for an indefinite period get on with it <laughs> um, and that period eventually stretched out to about 15 years I'd never really known whether I'd do anything or not again afterwards uh, I spent the intervening time with my growing family and uh, my growing business and uh, spent a great deal of my time working on theoretical things um, 
and then once I got the business and the family where I wanted it, I started to uh, get involved with slightly more public things again. Nice. So during the uh, retirement, uh, it, so it wasn't an abandonment of, like it wasn't a prodigal um, disavowal of magic going, well this was all garbage and we're all crazy. Uh, it was more, I'm, I've done this, I'm now going to do the science and business thing. Oh yeah, I was still doing a great deal of um, magical research on my own. I'm doing a, a little bit of casual correspondence, but I basically, um, I needed the time to sit down and create more ideas really. Uh, the IOT was eating my idea, ideas up at a rate I couldn't sustain. <laughs> I was expected to go over there every year and produce a whole massive new suite of stuff for them to have a go at and um, I thought no let them evolve their own rituals and ideas for a while and see where it goes I, I've got to take a I've got to take a break and sort my own ideas out really but I was conjuring and calculating fairly ferociously through that throughout the entire 15 year retirement nice I always assumed as much <laughs> whereabouts in India <laughs> India yeah well we basically just walked out, walked to the outskirts of London with a piece of cardboard saying India. Nice. Hitchhiked down all through Greece to Turkey. Uh, all through Europe, Greece and Turkey. And then after Turkey, it was mostly a case of getting buses and things. We went all through Iran and Afghanistan and Pakistan at a time when you could. Um, and then in India, we... Um, we firstly went. We went straight. We went and saw the Golden Temple at Amritsar, obviously, because that's on the way. But then we went and spent a good six months up with the Tibetans in uh, Dharamsala, and then after that, we went at about Christmas time down to the beaches in Goa. Rather rapidly oh. got bored with a beach scene. Uh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is for a couple of days. Yeah, sure. Um, and met up with this this crazy German who was recruiting a bunch of people to build boats to sail to the Maldives Islands. And uh, it's an extremely long story, but we ended up with two boats, sort of wrecked river craft that, that were just being sold off by the locals because they were just full of rot and, and at the end of their working lives. We ended up with two boats, but basically me and a Danish guy working on ours, and the German and a couple of other Germans working on his, and gradually more travellers joined us, and we spent about four months fitting these things up uh, for a sea trip. We put outriggers on the masts, and my wife stitched a load of sails, and we put rudders and keels on. It was a pretty massive undertaking. We had a camp on a riverbank where we did all this. We bought 500 engineering bolts from the ship chandlers to replace uh, rotten sections of wood with. We learned a certain amount about the local ship building techniques. And then we set off and um, we set off a bit late. The monsoon was coming. Fortunately, the wind was blowing more or less direct south. After two weeks, the Germans sailed their boat into an island and sank it. Um, so we rescued them. And uh, it was quite obvious that the idea of sailing to the Maldives was completely insane. So we decided we'd sail right down the coast of India, around the tip, and go to Sri Lanka. And um, that idea was seeming to work okay. We had a nice couple of weeks sailing, dropping in at small villages on the shore, until eventually one night we got hit by a typhoon which tore the mast off the boat. And uh, we were pretty lucky to survive, really. As dawn broke, we. Um, found ourselves outside Cochin Harbour. So we rowed the boat into there, hid it up a creek for a while, and um, 
eventually sold it for a couple of crates of beer. <laughs> so it had been four months to make the boat and about two and a half weeks sailing, but it was quite an adventure anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just leave my gloves here to reserve yeah. the table. Let's do that. The last time I came in here with Mr. Kite, we had the place to ourselves, and it wasn't a Friday. <laughs> all right, it, it all adds to the colour of the recording. <laughs> Well, you pay Foley artists millions yeah. to, to recapture that. Oh yeah. So more or less bringing it up to the modern day. What would in if you were king of the magic world, what would you like to see done differently? And it's kind of a question of what is the difference between when you first started and now uh, in uh, in the occult. And, yeah. Well, I'm not all that brilliantly well in touch with the entire magical world. Um, it's, it appears to be sort of a bit niche -y. Um I'm doing this uh, book launch at the Esoteric Conference and um, they brought uh, at least four or five different traditions together there. I had very little awareness of them, really. Um, and possibly, the, I don't know how much awareness they have of each other. I mean, I know a few people who've got a foot in more than one cap. Um, I myself have... Um, I've enjoyed going to Obod Grove for the last three or four years. It was quite different to, to what I'm used to, and I go mainly for the pleasure of the, of the company of the people there. They're very interesting people. Um, whether they call themselves part of, of the magical tradition or not, I don't know. Um, the Telemites seem more interested in, um, in uh, how should we say, religious and mystical aspects of their tradition than, than results magic. Um, results magic for me is has always been um, the starting point, really. Uh, and I wouldn't want to say all traditions should um, should concentrate on that, but um, <coughs> I do think it's it's neglect by some traditions is a bit cowardly, um, yeah. as if to say, well. We're so, we're so concerned that this might not work, and we're so concerned about how much effort it might take that we'll just we'll just look at the mystical New Age aspects of what we believe in instead. Um, whereas I think if someone is prepared to seriously entertain the idea of magic, they should really go for it. Cast spells all the time. Um, see if they can change reality. Um, that, that to me uh, is what is what fundamentally drew me to magic. I think could I Im could I improve my life on Earth with it? Um, I'm not saying everybody should do that. Some people prefer the more reflective and mystical aspects of it. Um, I'm not personally quite interested in. In what the possibility of magic has to say about the structure of, of reality. So there's a, a theoretical interest for me which might correspond to other people's mystical interests. Um, but no, I, I, I wouldn't want to be the king of magic. I wouldn't want things to be uniform. I think the strength of the esoteric tradition lies in its diversity. True. Was there more of an interest in um, experimenting with results magic when you were? Um, sort of post-college in London, I mean, that sort of um, pre-chaos days. Do you think there's a difference there? Yeah, I mean, that, 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 that has always been um, my main interest. Um, whenever I've uh, sought to bring magic to a wider audience through my books or through Arcanorium College, about the first thing I say to people is, right, Let's begin with enchantment. Let's start making some sigils and rituals and see if we can achieve some results. Um, because that was really how I got into it. 
you know, I I tried something and it worked to my own satisfaction. Um, I think rather than argue theory with people till the cows come home and teach them complex metaphysical systems, it's better to say, well, just see if you can make it work and then try and work out why afterwards. Uh, Julian's comment was um, the biggest change since when he started was obviously the internet um, and the what, what I think is uh, an access to like it, a complete access to sources where we could get um, the Corpus of Medica on our phone at this table in seconds um, but why I'm not sure why that hasn't led to some kind of um, repeat of the Renaissance um, and I think that's what it is. I think there's a I think digital behavior uh, affects uh, how people view sources and rather like just reblog reblogging um, the limit quotes pasted on a picture of Alistair Crowley on Tumblr. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I had to do it. I, I'm just old enough to be well and truly free internet. So, yeah, I had libraries and bookstores and, no. and at the edge of the earth, too. I think the internet has got some very severe limitations. I mean, it, it increases the information flow, for sure. But it decreases the quality of that information flow very radically. And it reduces people's attention span quite dramatically. I mean, I remember in the old days when people would communicate by writing each other letters or writing articles in magazines and then writing comments to people's articles. Um, you know, there's something to be said for making poets use bronze chisels on granite. Yeah. Um, when you can just splatter any old garbage onto a keyboard in a few seconds, the results are often very disappointing. Um, at an early stage, I, I decided that I would use that internet, but sparingly so. Uh, when I looked at so much of the rubbish flying around on the internet, particularly on the free forums, it encouraged me to open up um, the online college where people um, have to pay to get in. Well, the payment you know, maintains the site, but at least it does keep out people who just want to rant. Yeah. Um, and we do achieve a reasonable standard of debate and, and a fair bit of activity, but there's still a quite astonishing turnover of members. We get, we get some people who've been there for many years producing long, good long-term work, but we get other people whose attention span doesn't last a fortnight. Um, <laughs> Which is, you know, one of the downsides of the internet. <laughs> I find that there's, there's, it's inculcated a weird sort of service expectation which really surprises me I get people emailing me asking for stuff uh, do you think I might be on help desk because I have a blog like um, I can't get this to work how do I do this mm. I'm sorry what <laughs> uh, and, but uh, I'm not even these people aren't insane or just randomly asking stuff they genuinely expect that I'm going to sit down with my time and go well what you need to do are these things and it's just, I find that really fascinating absolutely yeah. um, I find that service expectation, uh, well, it's on the internet. You, you are obviously some 24 hour organization. Um, I also think, however, and a lot of it has to do with the kind of global geopolitics that's gone on uh, in the last 12 months. I think, in terms of magic, we're reaching a, I don't want to say post internet world, but a world where the internet uh, uh, has the level of prominence that it deserves. And I, I see a lot of groups. That are doing. Um, so I, I remember back doing Z cluster stuff in the mid '90s, where you'd log in with your 28.8 modem to try and do like a, a live, um, a, a digital ritual or whatever like that. And they were terrible. <laughs> uh, but 
I think we're in a post-internet world in the sense that people will use it as a method of communication and then actually meet. Or then actually, like there's a Dionysian group on Facebook which will just post, we're doing this at this time, um, interested or not. Like it's not on Facebook, um, this is what we're doing at this time. And I, I like that. It's, um, there was, for a while there, that kind of um, digital utopianism had that um, the internet was going to be this new magical space. It's not. It's, it's a method of communication. And, uh, and it's nice to see, I think, that going away and being replaced by people realizing that and doing stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, there's more uh, properly magical conferences this year in the UK than there has been for quite a while. There's that kind of stuff, which I think is good. Well, I use anti social media in the sense that I have a website that people cannot post replies on. Correct. Um, I did try a website once where I put up articles and people could reply. And I've just got hundreds of pages of gibberish uh, within a few days. Now, I tend to get one or two sensible email messages a week and three or four crazy ones, which I can handle. Um, and it's worth it for the one or two sensible inquiries I get. But I certainly wouldn't um, offer my web page open up on a free for all basis because it would just fill up with garbage. The um, forthcoming Apple basically <coughs> contains, firstly, a sort of encyclopedic survey of where the magical tradition came from. And it largely comes from the first and second centuries AD. I look at the origins of Hermeticism, Kabbalah, Gnosticism, and so on, and how this developed into magic over the succeeding uh, 14th century or so. And then we look at the, um, the great revival of the 1880s which has given rise to so much of what happened in the 20th century. And that seems to have culminated in the beginnings of what you might call an extraterrestrial perspective. Thinking beyond the mere traditional seven planets and all their attributes as to thinking towards maybe the magician's place in the entire universe. You would have mentioned of some of the, um, the people who have thought along such lines throughout history, like Gordiano Bruno. So it's a bit of a sort of a historical encyclopedic bit, the first bit part of the book. And then the next three parts are three separate grimoires, um, dealing closely with ele elemental magic, which has come down to us from, from classical times, earth, air, fire, water, and if you like, ether, and how that concept has, has developed over the centuries into what we have of it now. Then there's a long section on planetary magic, which is the bread and butter stuff of evocation and invocation. The, the various planetary god forms derived partly from um, classical conceptions, now modified by modern psychological insights, etc. Uh, looking at basically the archetypes of the human condition that fills up the middle section of the world. And here I've used a scheme of biplanetary classification because you plainly can't fit all the traditional pantheons into the simple tree of life Naples map. So I've come up with something a little bit more sophisticated there. And then the third, the third grimoire concerns what you might call the extraterrestrial perspective. Uh, the idea that it's overwhelmingly likely that all kinds of advanced knowledge already exist in the universe, and so how do we tap into it? And for that, I've taken a look at some of the uh, some of the ideas of Lovecraft, uh, some of the ideas of modern cosmology and physics, and so on, because I think the the old-fashioned uh, platonic 
pagan monotheism <laughs> is just about run its course now. Uh, a, a paradigm which has basically dominated magical thinking since the first and second centuries AD, reaching its culmination in the uh, in Victorian times. I think I think now we have to take on board wider perspectives, and that's what I've attempted to do in the third grimoire. I cannot wait. That is absolute music to me. Bluff, I've been very fortunate in working with Matt Cabrin, who um, I originally met through the Arcanorian College adventure. He illustrated um, parts of the Octavo. He's actually an extraordinarily talented graphic artist, and we've collaborated on an almost daily basis over the last four years on producing uh, graphic material to go with the book and an accompanying set of cards. These cards aren't primarily for divination. Regard them more as altar pieces. Although you can use them for sort of these purposes. But our aim is to produce them big, about the size of, uh, of a paperback book for each card. So you can actually use them in rituals for invocation, evocation, divination, enchantment, or whatever. Because in my experience, most most magicians don't use tarot cards or whatever just for just for simple attempts to divine the future. They use them for sort of complex commentaries or lateral thinking about much more complicated situations. So that's basically the approach we've taken in designing this uh, portals of chaos deck, as we've got.